Thank you for joining and welcome to uh, Lead Dev Bookmark. Lead Dev is a global community of engineering leaders who come together to discuss all things leadership, teams, tools, and tech. Bookmark is our monthly book club that takes place on the first Tuesday of every month or sometimes the second Tuesday, like today. <laughs> our sessions cover an array of engineering and leadership books that our awesome lead dev audience can draw insights and practical experiences from. I'm Susan Bond and I'll be your moderator for this discussion. I'm a former COO of a scaling startup and a leadership consultant. My specialty is tech leaders. You can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, at Susan Bond. Um, today we'll be talking about Leading from the Middle, a playbook for managers to influence up, down, and across the organization. Um, if you have questions for Scott, please pop them in the Q&A feature on Zoom. And Scott, for folks who don't know you, can you just give your, a, a quick introduction of yourself for those who aren't familiar with you and your work? Yeah, sure. I'm a former Procter & Gamble senior executive. I left uh, the company eight years ago to do this, to broaden my platform for making a difference with the written and the spoken word. So um, I've added to, you know, to my corporate experience, um, obviously the fact that um, I'm a, a four-time author and uh, I, ha I have a, an affiliation right now with as a faculty on reserve at Indiana University's Kelly School of Business. And I'm a, I'm a popular LinkedIn learning instructor too, where I put, a, I, I've created over 30 courses uh, within the LinkedIn learning universe. And I uh, pretty much love what I do. I'm a speaker uh, as well as in a workshopper and very excited to to be here today, calling in from the sunny coast of San Diego, California, where we moved so we could be close to our daughter who goes to film school in Los Angeles, but not smothery close. So San Diego <laughs> seemed the <a> perfect fit. <laughs> I love that. Close, but not smothering. We're sort of hovering, but not smothering. Exactly. Smothering. I love that. What a great introduction. Thank you so much for introducing yourself. Um, so let's start with my favorite question. How did this book come about? Well, I had spent over 25 years just in uh, Procter & Gamble, then another five years in Citicorp, Citibank. So I have over three decades of experience in, you know, big company life. And I remember noticing, you know, probably a good two decades ago, I started taking notice of the fact that there's an incredible amount. And Susan, you know, you know this, given what you, you do, you know this, that there's an incredible amount written about kind of the top tier, the C-suite. What do you do mm -hmm. in your first hundred days in the big job and how to look at the job from a high level organizational point of view? There's a ton of books written about people that are new to a company, new to a job, mm -hmm. how to get off to a fast start. There's a ton of books that are in the gray zone middle that are generally about leadership or some slice mm -hmm. of leadership, like emotional intelligence or innovation or strategic thinking. But there's was nothing that I can find that was specifically focused on the person who has to operate in the middle of the organization every single day. And that mm -hmm. addresses how incredibly complex that job is when you operate from the middle of an organization and you have to lead in all directions. And it really sparked a thought in a study beginning almost two decades ago of that complex relationship that happens when we find ourselves in leadership positions in the middle of an organization because of that lack of content out there. That's what really started my journey on creating the book leading from the middle. Mm, I mean, it, it's, it's a, it, I mean, we do need more information about it. I do think it's a very complex world, more complex. We love to joke about middle managers and middle management, but the roles are actually quite difficult and complex. Yeah. And mi middle managers, just so that the, the audience, you know, of yeah. engineering fan, you know, people and everybody else listening, Susan, just to make sure we're all on the same page. When I say middle manager, and then I'll talk about the complexity of the role, I'm talking about anybody that has to lead, you know, they have a boss and they are a boss or they aspire to be one someday. And they have to lead up, down and across the organization. They have to lead up to their boss, down to their employees, across to their peers to be able to do their job effectively, which means that's pretty much all of us. Even CEOs have a board that they have to report to. And so, what happens is this it creates an incredible dynamic that that I argue is the most difficult thing in all of leadership. This mm -hmm. unique dynamic that's created by having the tension of having to lead up to your boss, down to your employees, 
across to your peers at different times. And, and to your question now, just so that we had the context in the back. Yeah. The to your question now about the kind of the dynamics that the middle manager faces, there's nothing quite like it in leadership. And in the book, Leading from the Middle, you know, I talk about, um, I use a pretty simple acronym, SCOPE, S-C-O-P-E, because it refers to this incredible scope of the job that middle managers have to, have to work through. But it also refers to the five areas of complexities that middle managers have to talk to. And, and I'll hit each letter very, very quickly. But yep. the essence scope, first of all, middle managers have to deal with self-identity crises. And what I mean by that is they're mm -hmm. constantly changing roles, switching hats. And anybody out there, I'm sure, can, can appreciate this. You know, think about it. There are times when you have to be deferential to your boss. Then you have to be in assertive mode with your employees. Then you have to be in collaborative mode to your peers. Sometimes that could happen, Susan, within the context of one meeting. Uh -huh. You could be leading a team <laughs> meeting and your boss walks in and all of a sudden you have to change your hats and your mode to be like, okay, I have to switch over now to deferential stance because I wasn't in assertive mode, but now my boss is in the room. Or you could be in a room where your peers are, you know, you really have to get your peers to collaborate and get along and you have to get out of assertive mode because that's not necessarily going to work. You can go from moments when you feel tremendous autonomy as a middle manager to the next moment you feel like a cog in the wheel. You can yeah. have lots of decision-making space to all of a sudden you feel micromanaged. You can feel like you're making, you're on top of the world and you're so important to the company. And then the next minute you can feel like no one knows about you or cares what you do. It's these mm -hmm. constant switching of roles, these micro transitions mm -hmm. that creates a self-identity issue amongst middle managers. That's just one complexity. That's the essence scope. And interject anytime you want, Susan, but I'll, I'll, I'll go through the acronym quickly. The C in scope stands for the conflict that we constantly face when we're in the middle, right? We have conflict from above. Our boss cajoles us. Our peers won't collaborate. Our employees are annoyed with us. We have, you know, opposing agendas and we have hidden agendas and we have conflicts that we have to get in the middle of. Peers that aren't getting along right. We, maybe we're not getting along with our boss. Maybe we have to get two peers to work together to accomplish a goal. There's this constant conflict we're in the middle of. The O in scope is for omnipotence, meaning as a middle manager, you're expected to know everything. The boss's boss, not so much because they're too high up in the organization, he or she. If you're new to the organization, you're too new to know everything. But if you're in the middle of that role, you're often expected to know everything about your role and how to do everything all at once. The P in scope, and, and I'm going through the five unique dynamics of what it means to lead in the middle. The P stands for the physical unique problems that the middle manager can have, can, can mean, meaning there's no role more stressful. I talk about it in the book. A massive study, Susan, so it showed that. Yeah. Check this out. This is hard to believe. I couldn't believe it when I came across the findings that in the average organization, the bottom 5% of the organization, regardless of the size of the organization, the bottom 5% of employees in terms of happiness and engagement are not people who have poor performance reviews. Mm -hmm. They're not people that are too new to the organization. They don't even know what's going on. The bottom 5% in an organization and happiness and engagement are actually people who are doing well and have had good performance reviews. They just happen to be in middle management roles. Yep. It takes an incredible physical demand on us. And even the E in scope, an emotional demand on us too, because in the middle, you can feel alienation and isolation and loneliness. You don't really belong to any one group because you have to be the bridge between all of them. So there are an incredible amount of unique dynamics that faces us as a middle manager for us to overcome. Well, yeah, and I know we're going to talk about some of, we're going to talk about a bunch of these, you know, in our conversation. So I love that you um, talked about these five forces. One of the things when I read the book that was really interesting to me was the micro transitions. You know, I think we talk a lot about context switching, but you know, which is I think slightly different. But when you talk about micro transitions, I wonder if you could just talk about that a little bit more because when I saw that term, I thought, oh, that is so good. And I don't think we talk about it quite enough. Yeah, in in the book, I actually uh, have a section called, you know, how to rock all your roles. Uh, and through uh, over, geez, almost probably almost 10 years of research just on, you know, 
on this one topic, you know, I've identified over 21 different distinct roles that the average middle manager has to play and has to switch their hat between. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so for example, middle managers have to play the role of, uh, you know, what I call kind of a, a converter. They have to take the strategies that are mm -hmm. passed down from their bosses and then convert them into language that the employees around them can understand that they'll be motivated by. And they have to do this, by the way, Susan, sometimes when they don't even agree what's, would be, what's being passed down with them, they right. still have to take that content and convert it to the organization. Another role, they might have to play themselves, they might have to play uh, a strategist. Mm -hmm. You're not excused from coming up with strategies when you're in the middle, because frankly, you're closest to the day-to-day -day in the organization. And you might have the best ideas for what strategy should be. And oftentimes I hear, you know, people say, man, I, I don't have time for any strategic thinking in my role. Well, as a middle manager, you don't have time not to carve out mm -hmm. for strategic thinking within the context of your role. And, and uh, you know, you, you, you play the role of translator as well when what you have to communicate to your organization doesn't make sense if you just took it at, you know, ad nauseum. You, you have to you have to really convert that and translate it in a way that makes sense to the troops and so on and so on and so on. So we have all these different roles that we have yeah. to switch back and forth between. And it's key as a middle manager to remember, you know, the, the book is a book of hope, not, you know, not a book of, ah, what are we going to do now? I, it's, it's important to remember as a middle manager that you are the only one, you're uniquely suited to play those different roles to play a hundred different roles in one and it's a privilege you are the lighthouse for the organization that keeps people off the rocks yeah. in the short term and is a beacon for the long term you keep the long-term flame of strategy and the short-term flame of urgency to the organization there's this beautiful dance in the middle that you're uniquely uh, suited to do and you should take pride in it especially yeah. given those five dynamic complexities i did i talked about within the context of the scope acronym well yeah and and you know i think one of the things that i really enjoyed about the book too i mean i love the 21 forces i like identity i'm sorry 21 different like roles you have to play i think that we think oh it's like one or two it's actually quite a lot so folks i really highly recommend the book because i think that those 21 might help you go oh this is maybe why i'm struggling or why i'm i'm it's having a hard time but I think mindset, you also talk about mindset and why it's so important for middle managers. And you make this really great distinction between servant leadership and other oriented leadership, which I think is one of the mindsets that's, that I think you outlined that I thought was so important. Can you describe the difference between those two and why it's so important? Yeah, for sure. Thank you, Susan. You know, so first of all, just, just to make sure everyone's on the same page, we'll start with what's you know called servant leadership, which is where if you thought of the organization as a, a pyramid, for anyone out there that's just not sure what I mean by this term, you, know, you start with a pyramid, you invert the pyramid as a servant leader, right? You're now behind the scenes, putting the organization first and trying to lead from behind, literally serving the organization to get the organization to the end. And servant leadership is wonderful. There mm -hmm. are, however, for, especially for the middle manager, a few watchouts for servant leadership that that creates it's the same tree but a different branch. What I think is the better approach, and, and data has proven this to be true, is not servant leadership but others-oriented leadership, which is a, a branch from the same tree. And I'll explain the difference. Yep. Others-oriented leadership addresses some of the shortfalls of servant leadership that can crop up. For example. Servant leaders can sometimes, and, and this is an opinion, this is, you know, uh, research and, and data and fact now. Servant leaders can sometimes, Susan, lose themselves in their role to serve. They can lose their authoritative leadership voice. Yep. Yep. And what happens in their, in their very understandable, noble intent to serve the organization and their employees, they might not step up in those moments when the organization needs them to. Yeah. There are times when even upper management wants to see how you are doing as a middle manager, what your thinking is. They want to see you take the, the reins of control, not necessarily leading from behind this time, like servant leaders do, but leading from the front of the organization to not lose your authoritative voice. Sometimes servant leaders can lose sight of their own mastery. 
They want their expertise to shine through their people because they're serving them. And that's cool and that's good and that's noble. But there are times when the organization wants to see the mastery that you have in your role, your ability to consume all the information you have and lead from the front. So the important distinction here, Susan, is that others oriented leadership is really how middle managers should think about the mindset that they need. Your orientation is still about others first. It's about the ecosystem, not the ego system. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But that said, it's still important to remember that that organization needs you to step up front at times, in the, especially in times of crisis. And they need you still to do some things that don't feel like you're necessarily serving the best interests of the employees in the short term, but that they're things that are needed for the health of the organization over the long term. And others orientation allows you to get that balance right. Well, yeah, I mean, listen, I have frankly had I think there's some limitations I've thought about the servant leadership model. And when I read your book, I was like, ah, this is what I've been trying to say and point at, because I think sometimes in the servant leader model, we are focused mostly down and like on that individual employee level. But the problem, but the fact is we actually need to make sure that the organization is doing well, because if the company is not doing well, we don't have the money to pay our employees. You know, like we have to really think more a systemic approach while thinking about others. That's what I loved about, your approach. It really put the period at the end of the sentence I've been writing about. Something for me doesn't quite work about servant leadership. And I'm not saying it's bad, throw it out, but there's like a tweak to it. And I think other oriented leadership is for it. I also love what you say about, I think it also brings more flexibility. Instead of just, I'm only leading from behind. I'm like, oh, I can go over here. I can move over here. I can collaborate. I can lead from the front. I can lead from the back. There's more flexibility, I think, there. That's right. It's an orientation. It's mm. not tunnel vision. And that's yeah. the flexibility that I think the, uh, the mindset is needed for those who lead from the middle. Well, and listen, and I really want to make sure people who like, I understand why people love the servant, you know, servant leadership, because there's something about, let me take out my ego and care for people. And I think that is exactly right. Like instead of just making it about me. And I think obviously that came out of a tradition where of more autocratic leaders and, you know, where people maybe less cared less about employee and leading from the back. So I just want to make sure that we also, you know, don't throw it away. <laughs> abs absolutely. Which is, you know, why the, the model, the, the different branch of the servant leadership tree that I suggest others orientation, it still starts with the word others, Susan, right? <laughs> it's not, totally. you know, it's about the, it's about the, you know, the ecosystem, not the ecosystem. So that's, I think that's the, uh, the, the right way to approach it. And I love that. I love the nuance that you bring to that because I think there's a lot of nuance inside the book. And again, as I, I highly recommend folks read it because what we need is more nuance on these things and more um, definition. And the work that you've done also just for folks, I know you know this, Scott, but a lot of research. There's so much research and statistics in this book that I think really lend credence to what you're trying to say. And in fact, you interviewed, I mean, was it like 3,000? Yes, uh, oh, just a little bit over 3,000, yeah. Folks, to get some of your insights, you interviewed 3,000 folks. Um, okay, great. Well, so I'm away from an advertorial about the book, I didn't mean to do that, but I really did love it. Um, so I want to shift onto a different topic. Um, we might think that like the senior leaders, right, like the C-suite, those are the ones who are the key change makers, but middle managers play just as important of a role. And again, I know some middle managers, we might say C-suite are middle managers, but you know, folks who maybe they don't like, oh, but I'm, I don't have a C-suite title. I'm not, maybe, am I a change maker? You know what? I contend in the book that there may be no more important change maker, Susan, than the middle manager. Yeah. And that surprised people, surprises people sometimes when I say that, but, um, you know, I, I could bore you with all kinds of statistics and facts. And mm -hmm. even though this is an engineering audience that might disproportionately enjoy some of that, <laughs> I'll just <laughs> cherry pick here and say that it makes sense when you think about it, though. Middle mm -hmm. managers are in the best position of all to affect change, because first of all, they're the ones that has to pass down the change that gets passed down to them. And they have to like we were talking about before, they have to translate that change. They have yep. to lead that change often to an organization that is suffering from change burnout. 
that mm. has seen changes in the past not work that might think this change coming down the pipeline doesn't make any sense and yet still as a middle manager you're an on point to help make sure that that change flows through at the same time because you're in the middle of the organization you're in the absolute best position to help actually formulate that change and maybe even create that change because you're the at the intersection of the vertical and horizontal information flow in the company. And so there's no one better suited to have informed change and to lead informed change than a middle manager. And, you know, again, you're the one that has to translate that change for those that have to live it every day. Mm -hmm. When change is emotional, which it almost always is in some context, we think we're going to lose something due to change, right? Like our job, our identity, our sense of focus and place in the world. It's up to that middle manager to translate that change in a way that garners commitment to the change, not just compliance. And mm-hmm. I'll talk about how to do that in just a second. I just want to make sure, th- does that make sense to you, Susan, why oh, the yeah. middle manager is actually disproportionately the most important person in the organization to lead it? Right, because they're they're actually making it happen. It's easy, when I talk about change and think about it, it's easy to come up with these plans, but I say coming up with the plans is only like, Half the part, right? It's like an actual <laughs> first step. I'm like, cool, you got step one done. Now you have one through whatever. And we and it is those folks in the middle who are helping to make it real and reified and help people guide through it. Yes, that's exactly right. Yep. And so you wanted to say uh, talk a little bit more about um, change. And I think you want to talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. I, so I'm sure... You know, a lot of folks out there are like, okay, that sounds great, Scott. I get it. I'm the one that has to, I'm on point to lead this change, but what do you want me to do? You want to talk about a beast? And, you know, I get it. The truth is that, you know, it depends on the statistic that you follow, the study that you follow, but some studies, Susan, show that as much as 70%, 70, 70% of all change initiatives fail. Yeah. Whatever statistic you believe, you know, even if you're like, it can't be that high. I can't find a study that says it's not at least the majority of change initiatives fail because the Mm -hmm. leader of change too often don't get commitment to that change. They get, if they're lucky, mere compliance at best. Mm -hmm. If there's one thing I could share with your audience on as a middle manager, how to lead change, it would be this. And And I talk about it in the book, but I want you to remember what I call the circles of commitment. All of you out there, I want you to picture three circles interlocked, kind of concentric circles, same size, interlocked so that they overlap. And in the center lies commitment to change, not mere compliance, but Mm -hmm. true commitment. And in each one of these three circles, you just have to remember three things. This is your 80 for your 20. If you're leading change, if you can make the recipients of change feel safe, involved, and accountable, Those are the three circles that interlock. One is safe, one is involved, one is accountable. If you can make them feel those three things, I guarantee you, you're going to get your 80 for your 20 in making them feel committed to the change. When you make them feel safe, I'm talking about psychologically safe. Like they can make errors in the middle of this. They can feel they have the competence to change because they have before and they will again. They feel supported behind the change. They see that their leaders have empathy for what they're going through with a change. When I say involved, I'm talking about getting the recipients of change involved in the change early and often, not just deploying the change, because then it feels like change is happening to them, Mm -hmm. not for them, but getting them involved, giving them forms to feel heard so they could share their ideas about how to make the change better. When I say committed to the change, or excuse me, accountable to the change, of course, I'm talking about being clear about what's going to change when specifically, how will you uniquely be affected, dear employees, and and how will you be measured for that change as well? And here's the cool thing about this, Susan. So if you can make the employees feel safe, involved, and accountable, these are not mutually exclusive. They're interdependent, and I'll demonstrate. Let's say, Susan, you're like, okay, I got it. Safe, involved, and accountable. Most important to me, Scott, I have energy for making sure they feel safe. Okay, great. If you start by making your employees feel safe with a change, guess what? Because they feel safe, I guarantee you they don't, they're not going to mind as much 
being held accountable. And if they're mm -hmm. being held accountable, they're going to want to be involved. Now right. let's try the next one. Let's say, okay, I want to start with involved. I really want to make sure they feel involved. Great. If you have your employees involved early and often, guess what? They're going to feel safe. If they feel safe, they won't mind be held accountable. Now let's start with accountable. Okay, Scott, I hear you. I want to start with accountability. First and foremost, they have to feel accountable. I guarantee you, if you're focused on making the employees feel accountable, guess what? They're going to want to be involved. And if they're involved, they're going to feel safe. So all three things, safe, involved, and accountable, work together interdependently, deliver all three, and I guarantee you, you will get commitment to change, not just compliance. Yeah, I mean, it's so great. When I saw that model, I thought, oh, yeah, that, that's exactly right. Because I, I feel like, honestly, I feel like often we're like, this is it. You're accountable now. But without those two <laughs> other things, it's like, great. Or sometimes what happens is, you know, because they're not involved, we miss their perspective. And they can actually help us make sure, make us, help us make mistake. you know, so that we don't make a mistake because they actually, the, the employees are seeing the real things that are happening. They see the problems and they say, I hear you about your change, but what about X, Y, and Z, right? And also just to feel safe that like, I can be emotional or have a hard time with this, or I can fail and that's okay. I think it's just that model is so important to think about change. And I think a lot of us are going through change right now. I mean, the tech industry has gone through a tremendous amounts of change in the last year. Uh, I mean, it always is, but in the last year, it's been a lot. So, um, so safe, involved, and accountable. Any other thoughts about change for middle managers, or do we cover it all? Well, yeah, you know, just I have an entire chapter in leading from the middle dedicated <laughs> you to, do. to change. So I, I give it like a complete change model. The, you know, the one other tip I'll, I'll give, and there's so much I could go into, but just to just to remember as a change leader, you know, uh, there's something called the change curve, which is a model developed by um, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, a psychologist years and years and years ago, that says that the process of going through change for employees is very similar to the process of grieving yeah. and the stages we go through as we grieve. You know, we start out in the status quo, then we get into a denial period, then we get into an acceptance period and so on. And I talk about it in the book, but I bring that up to say that if there is a model that shows going through change is similar to the process of grieving, that tells you how emotional change can be for people. And a big mistake that change leaders often make is they forget that. Yep. They forget that we're worried about what we're going to lose that's associated with that change. Well, again, I was talking about this before, whether it's our, our identity, it might be our job, it might be a boss that we love because it's a reorganization. Um, it might be, you know, any number of things. And you just have to remember if you come from a other's orientation, and yeah. if you believe that change is emotional, you're going to approach differently how yeah. you lead that change at the end of the day. You can't not if you remember that point. Well, yeah, and I will just mention, I apologize to mention another author in here, but I love the book Transitions by William uh, Bridges. Yep. So, you've heard of the book. It's a class. It's an old book. It's a classic book. And he talks a lot about emotions and that like, it's not just change, it's transition. So really underscoring that there is a huge body of work that agrees with you. And that is really important about making sure we focus on the emotions, not just the bits and bobs of how the change happens. That's absolutely, so, yeah. Most, most people actually, Susan, to your point, they don't fear the change itself. It's not, that's not what's painful. Like, you know, if you want to, um, I'm making this up. If, if someone said, oh, okay, I want to change my body makeup. I want to lose 20 points or 20 points, 20 pounds, right? I want to lose 20 pounds. You don't dislike the thought of being 20 pounds lighter. It's that transition to it and what it's going to take. I have to cut out all my favorite foods. I have to exercise five times a week. I have to start drinking water 18 times a day. To your point, it's that transition. And um, you know, within the book, I talk about a model that helps you manage that transition for employees, which can be highly emotional. Yeah, no, it's great. I, it's a great, a great chapter. I really want to make sure we covered the change. So I want to go back to something that I think I think it relates a little bit with the scope uh, model or from earlier, but like there's really high rates when you talk, and you talked earlier about like most unhappy employees often are middle managers, not people doing poorly performance problems, but you know, so why are there such high rates of, you know, burnout for middle managers wow. and what can we do to mitigate it? I mean, I think some of it is in that the forces, but I'd love if you could just talk a little bit more about that. 
Yeah, yeah. You know, it goes back to the, you know, the signs of burnout, which we'll talk about, and then how you address that. You know, what's amazing to me, Susan, at the time I was writing this book, the World Health Organization issued kind of a decree that burnout was now considered an occupational hazard uh. and disease in the workplace because it had become so rampant. For the World Health Organization to weigh in and say burnout is now a medical condition, that tells you how rampant it's got. And you know, to, to understand why it happens, you just have to go to the classic signs of burnout, right? And if you think about it, and I talk about this in the book, but here's how you know someone's burned out. And for you, those of you out there, if some of these symptoms are common and familiar to you, it's something you might want to think about that, you know, uh, how can we address that, which I'll get to in a second. But, you know, you know when someone's feeling burned out when they have low energy, apathy and disengagement is starting to, to creep in. And, and you think about it, there's all kinds of things at work that can cause us to mm -hmm. feel both of those things. It can, sometimes it could just be one boss can cause both of those. One bad <laughs> boss can cause low energy and a sense of apathy. We know signs of burnout include increased cynicism and increased complaining, decreased productivity, decreased quality of the work, self-isolation where you, you're not bothering or being social with anybody at work anymore, which is happening more and more as we go to a remote work world naturally, let alone on top of it, someone's disengaged and wants to self-isolate anyways. There's more mm -hmm. irritability, there's more absenteeism. So when you think about all the signs of burnout, you could easily say, yeah, well, I know like five things at work that make me feel that way. So the, the nature of work is becoming more and more very easy for us to experience burnout. So what do you do about it? That's probably the bigger question. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, one of the things I'm really proud of in the book is uh, it took us almost a year of, of isolated research to do this, but we've identified and verified, statistically speaking, mm -hmm. four questions that break out from the pack that you can ask yourself. If you suspect you're suffering from burnout or if you have an employee that you think meets some of those signs and could be suffering from burnout, ask four questions, either of your employee or talk this with your boss if you're the one that, that could be suffering here. Four questions. Number one, the obvious one. Okay, is it too much work? Yeah. And we'll use ourselves as an example. Am I engaged in too much work, right? Is it just too much work? That's the obvious one. This is where you have real discussions with prioritization with your employer, with your boss, right? You, you really have to step back and prioritize work. Number two, is it the wrong work? Meaning, mm -hmm. is the employee engaged in work that is outside of their role? Are they not clear on what their role is? Is it work that's not a good fit with what their strengths are? And we see burnout all the time for people that are in roles that they're not a good fit for. They can work twice as hard as the next person, but if they're not naturally born or not naturally good for that role, that's more likely to create burnout than something that they're working in that's leveraging their natural strengths. Yep. Third question, is it, are you getting the wrong response to your work? Meaning, are there too many barriers in the way naturally? Is there toxicity in the air? Do you have a group of toxic coworkers that won't collaborate with you? Do you feel underappreciated because no matter what you do, you get the wrong response. Enough is never enough. Good is never good enough. The wrong response to your work often creates burnout. And then finally, of course, do you have unrealistic expectations of your work? Mm. Are you holding yourself to a standard that no one else is? And we see that a lot of times with uh, type A people that want to excel in their organization. They're holding themselves to a standard close to perfectionism that nobody else is. So you remember these four questions. Is it too much work? Is it the wrong work? Are you getting the wrong response to your work? Do you have unrealistic, unrealistic expectations of your work? Discuss those with your boss or with the employee. And I promise you, there's at least a path to a healthy discussion about solving burnout. Yeah, I mean, so those questions are really good because it. We, I think we often think it's too much work, but that is in fact only one of the the four factors as you talk. You know, the four questions you need to ask yourself. So I'm noticing our time. I'm going to go to a little bit of a speed round, sure, um, yeah. not completely speed round. You know, you don't have to shout out your answers like we're playing a game show, but um, but I just want to ask like your best tips for managing up, down, and across? Because I think that's one thing that people really care about yes. and find difficult at times. Okay, uh, let's see, speed run. Okay, so up, uh, managing your boss. I, I can't talk about enough 
the importance of getting clear on expectations with your boss. Let me point out one piece of research we did in the book very quickly. We did a piece of research I call the FBI research because we brought in, uh, well, it, at the time, it was just a little bit over 200 pairs of bosses and subordinates into a, a research facility. People that, you know, the, the, the boss and their corresponding subordinate. We put them in separate rooms so that the other person wouldn't know what the other person was saying about them. Mm -hmm. That's why we call it the FBI research. Then we asked each <laughs> person, <laughs> the boss and the subordinate, questions about expectations. What does your boss expect from you and vice versa? And we found in over 80% of the cases, Susan, there were material breaches in the most basic understanding of expectations when we forced people to articulate what they thought was expected of them. Bottom line is, I say this with love in my heart, no matter how clear you are, uh, you think you are and what your boss expects from you, you're probably not as clear as you should be. And there's a set of questions in the book I won't get into here that you can ask of your boss to make sure you are 100% crystal clear on what's expected of you. That's uh, my best tip for leading up. Uh, another tip for, let's say, let's say for leading down to your employees <laughs> is to just be really good about mastering feedback. Mm. It, it's such an important gift. It's also an important skill to develop. You have to be specific with it. You have to be sincere. If it comes from the hard sticks in the mind, you have to be calibrating, letting them know, well, this feedback means that, you know, you're off track or you're right on track and, and it's to be expected. You have to mm. be proportionate with it. Meaning in general, we do a lot more good than we do bad. Susan employees want to be reminded as such. Yeah. In general, our data shows us that one piece of corrective feedback to every five pieces of positive feedback is about the right veneer, about the right place. So you really have to get feedback right. And I go deeply into the book on how to do that when you have employees. And for leading across, my best tip is what I call the golden rule of influence. And it works like this. We'll do a simple example. Susan and everybody out there, I want you to think right now of somebody in your life who's had a tremendous influence over you, but that you didn't report to them. There was no formal reporting a structure or authority. So think about that for a second. Let me know when you can visualize that person in your mind. All right, I'm gonna assume you have that person in your mind. Uh -huh. Is that fair, Susan? Okay, yep. not necessarily a boss, someone in your life who's had great influence. Now, is this true, Susan, that person you have in mind? Did they do any of these four things? Did they show that they cared? Did they listen? Did they give you something? Did they teach you something? I'll bet yeah. all four. Is that true? All four. That is the golden rule of influence. If you mm -hmm. want to influence your peers, if you could focus on making sure you're giving them something, that you're listening, that you're teaching, or that you're showing them that you care, I guarantee you will at least double the influence you have over your peers in an employee setting. And oh, by the way, over other people in life, because that's what we're all looking for. Uh, in, in, you know, peer to peer relationships. That's up down and across speed round. <laughs> you did great. And I'm going to have one, I want to end on one last quick question, but I do want to say, I love, thanks for that. It was a great speed round. Um, and I love that you talked in, the, I love the chapter about across. I find it in my work managing across and how do I build a relationship? How do I do this? People have a lot of questions about it, especially as they're like, wait, I'm moving into what I think of as more like really organizational leadership. I'm really having to work across outside of engineering much more often. How do I do it? How do I build relationships with finance? How do I build these things? So that chapter and your advice in there is really, really helpful for folks. I highly recommend that specific chapter. Um, I find that all the time in my work. So my last question, I love to ask this question in the course of writing the book, you talk to thousands of middle managers, right? Like 3, 000, over 3,000. And I'm just curious, what was one thing that surprised you or that might surprise other people that we haven't mentioned yet? I was, I was stunned at the number of times, Susan, when, you know, when you, you sit down and interview someone, you have to tell them why. The number of times that people would just say, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you looking at this through the lens of my unique role, the, the role of the middle manager somebody who has that dynamic of having to manage up, down, and across because I haven't seen anything out there like that that could help me on this. I, I don't have a guide. No one has been able to articulate why my job is so hard leading from the middle. And so I, I knew I was onto something when I was researching the book before I'd even written it. 
because it's not always sexy to write about it. You talked about it up front, right, Susan? <laughs> Pop culture right. loves it. We have the shows like The Office, movies like Office Space, cartoons like Dilbert. We love to make the term middle manager. Um, uh -huh. you know, we like to have fun with that. And the truth is middle managers should feel proud. We know that middle managers make up for the variation of more than 25% of revenue in the average organization. That's three times more than people whose only job is to innovate for the company. You know, so we know that middle managers make a tremendous difference. I have tons of data in the book that show just how valuable a middle manager is to the company. And, you know, I was just so surprised to see people saying, finally, someone's looking at the world through the difficult and unique lens that I have to in an organization where I have to lead in all directions to, to uh, thrive and just survive at times. I love that you ended on that note. I had no idea what you were going to say, but I love that we ended on that note, a hopeful note. And um, thank you for joining us during this session. Um, it was really a pleasure. Our next guest joining us on April 2nd is Marty Kagan, who has a new book out. Um, actually, mine arrived just before uh, this conversation. So I'm excited to be talking with him. Um, but Scott will be joining us over on the Lead Dev Slack, we'll be, where he'll be taking some questions. Head over to the Bookmark channel where that'll be taking place. Thanks again for joining me, Scott. Thank you.